When uh, Bill Clinton was inaugurated, it was in one of his speeches, he, he recognized one uh, single individual as being very important to him philosophically. And his name was Carol Quigley. He wrote the book Tragedy and Hope. Now, the important part of Tragedy and Hope and Car Carol Quigley is that he claims that he was on the inside and part of the group that you know, did the planning. But why did he write Tragedy and Hope to expose these people behind the scenes? Uh, because he, he believed they were far enough advanced, it didn't have to be secret, they could be out in the open, and uh, this is the way it works. It's a tragedy if you don't accept this, and there's hope if you know who runs the show. That's, a, that's my interpretation, but I believe it's correct. But let me read a quote from him. And uh, thinking about where he's coming from, he says the argument that the two parties should represent opposed ideals and policies, uh, one perhaps the right of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to the doctrinaire and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shift in policy. For two years, Professor Carol Quigley is allowed to examine the confidential papers and secret records of this network. Quigley reveals that these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world, and the CFR is their most visible conduit for carrying out that agenda. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons, as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. Ruling class journalists, written by Richard Harwood, describes the CFR membership as the ruling establishment in the United States. The Washington Post article boasted that news reporters who are CFR members do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the United States. They help make it. And the Council on Foreign Relations, <coughs> I don't know if I'm an official member. I, I've spoken there before. Now, I won't stand here and pretend that we can or should undo the economic transformations that have taken place over the last decade. Uh, globalization is here to stay. There are jobs that aren't coming back, and this world will always be more competitive. His foreign policy is an endeavor. His foreign policy is the same as McCain's foreign policy. Let's continue meeting Barack Obama's recently appointed senior working group on national security. William Perry was Clinton's secretary of defense and restructured the U.S. defense industry. He worked as a consultant for Marty Marietta before Clinton. Lockheed Martin, the U.S. largest weapons manufacturer, was created in a merger just a few months after Perry started with his restructuring. And Marty Marietta became part of Lockheed Martin. Perry retired in 98 and joined the board of Boeing. And he also joined the Saudi-based Carlyle Group, whose partners include some very well-known oil men, George Bush Sr. and James Baker. Lee Hamilton is a former chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And most importantly, he co-chaired the Iran-Contra investigation, the Iraq study group, and the 9-11 commission, which for many Americans did not answer the really tough 9-11 questions. Hamilton enjoys the reputation of being an ultimate insider, a Washington wise man. But don't expect anything controversial from him. Tim Romer was a member of the 9-11 commission, and he voted for Bush to invade Iraq. Rice is in charge of Obama's so-called pragmatic counterterrorism plan, referring to Colin Powell. Well, I think he, is proved, he has proved that uh, Iraq has these weapons and is hiding them, and I don't think many informed people doubted that. You said you thought troops should be withdrawn. No, no, I've never said, tro I, I've never said that uh, troops should be withdrawn. What kinds of troop presence do we need uh, to have a counterterrorism strike force in Iraq that assures that al-Qaeda does not uh, regain a foothold there. Uh, if you follow uh, my plan to begin withdrawing troops and having our combat troops, combat troops, combat troops out in 16 months, we're talking about approximately two years from now having our combat troops, combat troops, combat troops out. 
we have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Would you as president be willing to have a military surge in Afghanistan in order to once and for all eliminate the Taliban? Yes, I think that's what we need. I think we need more troops there. And we're also going to have to address the situation in Pakistan to hunt down uh, al-Qaeda and make sure that that does not become a safe haven for them. A remixed Clinton III cabinet is not exactly a radical departure from a Bush-Cheney imperial foreign policy. Americans will ask the question, is this really change we can believe in? I will do everything in my power to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Everything in my power to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Everything. That old Beach Boy song, Bomb Iran. <laughs> bomb, bomb, bomb. <laughs> the danger from Iran is grave, it is real, and my goal will be to eliminate this threat. Its support for terrorism and threats towards Israel have increased. The enemies that we're going to have to fight is not just terrorists, it's not just Hezbollah, it's not just Iran. Israel is our ally and we will protect Israel. More importantly though, we should be keeping our nuclear arsenal out of the hands of Iran, which is why I've called consistently for uh, sanctions. Uh, the Zionist movement was something that I related to and connected to. Who the hell are we going to nuke? Senator. Tell me, Barack, who, who, Barack, who's, I'm not who are you to wanting to nuke? Any, I'm not planning to nuke anybody right now, it, right now, it, right now. It, it, Iran is a threat. Iran is a, an adversary. Their pursuit of nuclear weapons poses a grave threat to us. Iran is now enriching uranium, and it has reportedly stockpiled 150 kilos of low enriched uranium. <laughs> So this is where the buck stops in Iran. He is the boss, Ayatollah Khamenei, not Ahmadinejad. And he's saying flat out once again so everybody understands. Iran does not need a nuclear bomb. It is anti-Islamic. If Iran fails to change course when presented with this choice by the United States, it will be clear to the people of Iran and to the world that the Iranian regime is the author of its own isolation. So Obama is saying he'll lead tough negotiations, but if they fail, he will apply Joe McCain's and Ehud Olmert's apocalyptic medicine. Is that change in foreign policy? Doesn't sound like it. Obama, and I'd like to spell his name O-B-O-M-B-A, because